the first case which uh, which uh, uh, we will be doing ebus on uh, we have a team of experts who already gone there to the ot is of a, a for 29 year old male an it employee so he presented with uh, subacute illness 2 to 3 weeks history of uh, fatigue cough some evening rise of temperatures loss of appetite loss of weight um that's all so no no major comorbidities he was a reformed smoker and occasional alcohol consumer the bloods are reasonable this is what we had spoken about <laughs> cbp creatinine viral screen and coagulation profile are normal uh, a ct chest x ray actually basically x ray was done for him so x ray showed bilateral hilar prominence so then a ct was ordered uh this is the ct uh, contrast ct because there is hilar lymph nodes hilar en enlargement we are asked for a contrast ct so if you can see beautifully uh, where is the pointer yeah so now can anyone tell what is this node from the first talk so this is the subcranial you have the uh, 10 r you have the 10 11 r 11 l i think probably every every nodal station is there you also have uh, station 5 which is lateral to the uh, ligamentum arteriosum you have a small 4 l so this this has probably most of the lymph nodal stations which have been discussed the same thing we will be seeing on the ebus uh, anatomy also uh the lung parenchymal cuts grossly normal some fissural thickening if you can closely look at it in the some areas same thing the video yeah so the video of the ct scan from uh, from apex going down so this is the as we see here paratracheal node seems to be much smaller 4l5 you can see the 10r 11r 7 10l 11l so all the nodes are there hmm. seem to be more symmetric little bit larger on the right side and that's about it so that is in brief about uh, this case now i will hand over to the moderators who so will take over so do we have a to the auditorium do you have any other limbs not passable okay. we palpated the nodes we got an ultrasound there there are no no nodes is very important thing because always palpate the neck whenever a person comes with uh, medicinal lymph node pathi if you have a palpable lymph node i think that is a much less invasive and patient friendly ways to get a diagnosis yeah pratip can you hear us can hear you yeah, all, all the all the audience is uh, back those who are sitting in the in the in the uh, far end i think they can come closer the, 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 the delegates who are sitting there i think more back you are the more uh, conducive it is to you will not uh, focus please come friend over to pratik yes sir so dr rohan is starting the ebus case sir So, scope yes, sir. Scope. so so in this in this case he is using the bf uf uc 190 scope which is a 6.6 .6 mm scope with a working channel of 2.2 mm and we are using the eu me3 processor so the history has already been uh, uh, presented at the conference now we will start the procedure so we are doing the procedure under general anesthesia with an lma eye gel so Yes, so we will just put the. We'll just clean the tip. So, so we are at the level of the vocal cords right now. So uh, since this is a post lunch session, uh, I have a question for the audience. How many of you feel that uh, pre-check bronchoscopy is required before performing ebus for this case? So almost 80% people here uh, so, feel. So, so we, we have a we uh, check bronchoscopy. Yes, yes, we have already done a check bronchoscopy pre-procedure, and then proceeded for the ebus. Okay. So we do that to rule out any endobronchial growth or any mucosal changes. Yes. So now we are at the carina. Yes. So, so sir is going into the uh, RMB right now. 
uh, now we are the secondary carina you can see the upper lobe and the right intermediate bronchus so he is in the right intermediate bronchus now now back to the carina going to the left side so this is the left secondary carina so we can see the left upper lobe left lower lobe here so now we are shifting over to the ultrasound mode so we have put the settings with at 10 megahertz gain is at 15 contrast at 5 And, and depth is at 4 cm depth is at 4 cm yes so sir is at the subcranial level now we can see the left atrium below so now we have on the power doppler we are seeing a single vessel coming from the hilum so now we are going on to the station for uh, 11 11R 11RS which is at the secondary carina so here you can see you can, you can see a hilar vessel no that is the hilar vessel there so you can see the hilar vessel and just superior to the hilar vessel you can see a lymph node yes there is yes even here there, are, there is the 11r node then mo moving on to the left side so we are going to the 11l so we can see a large 11l node a well a well defined with clear borders homogeneous and doppler we can see that there is absolutely no blood flow in inside the lymph node can we have the screen frozen the epa screen frozen with the yes. lymph node on it please one second one Just second yeah we'll focus on the 11l and we'll do that uh provisional diagnosis look like based on the um, imaging appearance and uh, does the audience want any more information in the clinical details one important information was missing anyone in the audience or the faculty or the mediastinal appearance node appearance how does it look to be what would you suspect in such a case what what information is dr valipan asking for i mean even before the ebus was done maybe on the ct scan or even simpler simpler than a bronchoscopy nobody wanted a tuberculin skin test i think uh, anyway this could be one of the granular matter diseases so a tuberculin skin test several times as i say even, even if uh, we do not find a mycobacterium we would uh, rely largely on an antibiotic spent as for decision and the i think now that the con this thing has come so before proving a granuloma would you ask for a tuberculin skin test because normally we do ask but once we have a confirmed uh, granuloma so if at all it turns out to be got for the team expert for the why do you need a tuberculin skin test <laughs> reason why i might ask for a, a tuberculin skin test prior prior hand is if i have a high probability of sarcoidosis i might consider doing an endobronchial and transbronchial biopsy along with it uh, and if it's tuberculin skin test positive i might uh, avoid uh, uh, additional procedures to be done the way i actually thought uh, valipan was indicating was whether there was any kind of necrosis that was seen on the ct in terms of its contrast enhancement so that's probably the i thought he was seeking or the tuberculin test anyway the reason i wanted uh, the guys to stop there uh, was also because i just thought briefly we'll just talk about the characteristics so whenever you're talking about lymph node characteristics seven important points have to be uh, noted so one is the size the size of the lymph node the second one is the shape shape of the lymph node the third one is the borders okay then you look for central hilar structures and coagulation necrosis sign 
And the last one is the central intranodal vessel. I think they already demonstrated it with Doppler. Now, if you look at the literature, there are multiple papers on either side. The PGI group has also done a lot of work on it and I think some AIMS papers are also there. Uh, if I remember by Ayub Khan or somebody like that. What finally it boils down to is without sampling the lymph node, you can't with any degree of great confidence say that uh, you know it is malignant or it is benign. Uh, there are some characteristics, two or three of them when you combine, when you are likely to say that this looks benign, there are some of them where you combine those characteristics and say they are malignant. But the bottom line is you have to sample the lymph node. This is just uh, as the science has evolved, people were trying to look for if this is possible. So uh, this is the size oh, measurement, they are so looking at uh, both the axes. Yes, yes. Uh, of course we know that the lymph node is enlarged, the lymph node is heterogeneous because you can see that uh, you know there are uh, areas which don't, are, I mean the lymph node is not really uniform. The margin is definitely distinct. Uh, I would say coagulation necrosis sign is positive. The central hyalus structures are negative. And of course, uh, can we have the demonstration of the central intranodal vessel on this by any chance? Central yes, yes, sir. That, that node also had a small heterogeneous head in the center, which yeah. we were thinking it to be necrosis sign. So yes, sir. Put a Doppler and show that there is no pathway. Yes, sir. Very good quality for a CNS. Yes, so, so now they are trying to look for any centra internodal vessel and you can see that the Doppler mode is on. You can't see any great vasculature at this point in time. Can I idea is to put a needle in Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so okay. now we will demonstrate how to insert the needle and how to fix the sheath. Okay, uh, Pratip, uh, just yes. a question here. Now this is a case where, uh, you know, uh, it's a 29 year old male, he has loss of weight, loss of appetite. Yes. My top three differentials would be definitely a granulomatis, either sarcoid or TB. And of course, I keep lymphoma in mind. Yes. So, uh, where would you start? I mean, every single station that you showed us, you said it's enlarged. Yes. So, do you want to start on the right side? Do you want to start on the left side? Do you want to just sample the subcarinal? What would your approach be in such a situation? And Sir. why? Uh, in this kind of situation, I would definitely target the largest node and the node if in case where the CNS sign is present, then definitely would like to target that node to get material for microbiology and definitely we have to look for the blood vessels to, to take a safe site to do the aspirate and the biopsy. Well, even, do you have anything to add? Uh, uh, the larger nodes are sometimes highly vascular, so that might prevent uh, a good sampling. So, uh, the seven node which we saw right now had a central vessel which was running in between. So, you need to be careful if you are sampling or the other way is to sample the 11 L which anyway they would be sampling. It was clean and the vessel only on the periphery of it and not in the center. Uh, otherwise, uh, based on the CT also it looked as if it was a sheet like in, not a discrete kind of lymphoma. So, I think lymphoma also should be described the whole uh, Was this case, uh, did they do an ACE levels or did a peripheral sphere for lymphoma? Or? No, we, 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 C, CBP was done, so there were no typical cells. ACE level by, by uh, rule we stopped it. So, we don't do ACE level even after we confirm that. You know? Because it either confirms nor uh, disproves the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Yes, sir, we can start off with the needle I insertion. Think we can start off uh, with the needle insertion. Uh, Pratik, can you uh, just tell us when the needle is inserted, the parts of the needle very quickly, like yeah. really brief but quick? Dr. Nitish. Yeah. So, Dr. Dr. Nitish is handling the needle, sir. So, the part he is holding right now is the stillet. Okay. That is the needle length adjuster that sir is adjusting okay. that determines the depth of the needle okay. then this is the sheath adjuster the knob to adjust the length of the sheath okay. the row of the sheath is basically to protect the scope from the needle puncture okay. protect the scope sorry not the sheath the needle is and this is the fixing uh, the fixing hub, the fixing hub. Okay. yes sir so, just so for the audience here, there are two things you have to note in the needle. There is one knob which you move, it is only to adjust the length of the needle inside the scope, right? And there is another part which adjusts the needle length inside the lymph node. Both of them are just adjacent to each other, and that is something that you have to understand. If you read the classical text, there will be about 15 steps described on handling ebus needles, but if you understand the function of 
every step you don't really have to know them in that sequence or in that order it actually comes to you automatically so don't read those books and then get bogged down by those 15 steps and try to mug them it's unnecessary as long as you understand the function of each of those knobs your life becomes very easy while doing it first so the needle is a 19g so yes so you're using the 19g flex needle so uh, i think the most important complication uh, of this procedure is the scope damage so uh, identifying the sheet and keeping it in a proper position is the most important step i think they'll be demonstrating it right now how to confirm yes. the position of the sheet so that is before we are going to the sheet before you enter so 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 we have fixed the adapter, adapter for the for the for the 19g needle yeah. and now through that we are inserting the 19g needle uh you should always be careful not to keep the scope flexed at the time of inserting the needle So now the needle is inside. Now we are fixing that, locking it. Now we fix the sheet. Inside, outside only. Bahari karein. So the knob that is currently being moved is the knob to adjust the length of the needle inside the lever. So here you can see that the sheet has come out. So the sheet needs to. Can you show the other end as Dr. Nitish is moving? Yeah. Okay. Yes. We can see that. So now we are we are we are getting the sheet out. and we have to adjust it to so just be just slightly visible in the top right corner as we can see in the endocardial ultrasound yeah, image that's in the perfect. top right corner at the 1 o'clock 2 o'clock position the sheet should be just seen this indicates that uh, uh, it, the sheet has come out of the working channel and it is safe to bring the needle out and it is unlikely to damage the scope uh, we, we should be careful about this step and in the same this step is uh, could be quite costly This is how we fix the needle. Yeah, so this is how we fix the needle, and now we'll go inside and do a pass with the 19G needle. So this fixing of the sheet can be done inside also. Yes. Here it was demonstrated outside, but for those uh, who are seeing, we, most of the times it is done while the scope is uh, in the trachea, in the neutral position. So that is where the sheet is usually fixed inside. So as they were measuring the lymph nodes previously, they could come back to the trachea and then uh, see the sheet and then uh, continue the passes. So here, for the purpose of demonstration, they had uh, removed it out and demonstrated it. Yes, so this is at the carina. Now we are going to the left main bronchus at the secondary carina. Here we can see the uh, heterogeneous 11L node. Yeah, I will fix. It. So now one person has to fix the scope while the operator inserts the needle in the working channel. Scope is uh, important because while we bring in the sheath and the needle, the scope may lose the contact with the tracheal wall, and you might lose the vision. So holding it in position becomes important because we need a, uh, a non-air interface between the scope and the. Uh, no which we are visualizing so we are in position now yeah we had already fixed the sheet so you already fixed the sheet we are in position now other thing is always uh, have a look at the inside image which is the endobronchial vision so ideally when we do a procedure we should be able to see the needle coming out two, two, as two in the conventional tv lens oh so we now see it apart from what we see in the ultrasonic camera So after so going inside, we will. Ah, no, no, we will come to come up to the. Come up and take care. Ah. So we'll be. So we'll just readjust the sheath here. Plus the endobronchial vision for the sake of the audience. Yes. Enlarge the endobronchial vision. Ah. So here the sheath is being confirmed while we are inside the trachea. Let me move outside than what you would like, but. 
the scope becomes a little uh, less flexible once the sheath and needle are in situ. So one might have to use a balloon to make a contact if required. So sir, this is the 190 scope we are using. So unfortunately, the balloon that is available with us, it does not fit thugly to this scope. So we have not put a balloon for this scope as of now. And Olympus does not recommend the use of a balloon with this particular scope. No, it is said that it is more flexible than the conventional 180 series scope. So you would be able to oppose most of these patients. But you can still put the older balloon to the 190 scope also. It is not that you cannot put the older balloon. Mm -hmm. You can yes. see it, but it functions as good as in, as in, in a uh, larger ego scope. So especially for uh, difficult to sample lesions, uh, the contact would be better if there was a balloon. Mm. Rubbing on this Okay. So you are on the right side now? No. We are on the One left second. side. We are on the left. Uh, no. We yes, are in position yes. now. So now we are in position. Uh, we have already fixed the needle. We have already fixed the sheath. We have no. fixed the needle length at two at two centimeters. And you have should have a person holding the scope and, at the and, and, and I am fixing the scope at the level of the eye gel. Now slowly jab inside. And you push a little from here. Withdraw the and needle. withdraw the needle. Because we are counter puncturing the node. Yeah. This yeah. should be the ideal position. Now we are in the center of the node. You will use the stillet to expel the bronchial contents from the needle. You can remove and the Doppler as well. And pull the stillet out. Yeah. And use the negative suction. Yeah. And we will use a vacuum lock. To give minus 20 suction, we will unlock the yeah, vacuum, vacuum and, then and then do revolutions from one end of the capsule yes. to the other. We are this, as we can see, we are in the center of the node. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, The use of uh, seeing the echogenic texture of the nose is that if there are the hypo echoic areas or the dark areas, if you can aspirate them. In a case of tuberculosis or something, you might aspirate first, which might be a better sample for microbiologists. So, we have done about 15 revolutions here, and after that, we have closed the vacuum and taken the needle out. So here you can see we are making a slide using a syringe filled with air. We will expel the material of this of the 19 G needle onto a slide. The other material will be taken in the in a container for cell block or microbiological studies. Often do you get a core and such kind of uh, uh, larger uh, needles? So, I think the, the getting a core is not absolute. So, sometimes you get, sometimes you do not get. Multiple Even with the 19G, it is not absolute so process. So, it, it, no, I think it, it doesn't depend upon the operator, it is more by chance. Acquired. Acquired. Uh, at the end for the 19G. But for the other needles which will be shown, they acquire and the pro core. At, at least for the acquired the fracturing tip needle, yeah. what so our experience is that most yeah. of the times you tend to get a core. If it's a true core or a false core, it's a different thing. But most of the times you get a core with the the fracturing tip uh, acquired needle. That thing will be shown next. Pratip, can you show the next procedure? Uh, now we will be proceeding. The pathologist sees the yeah, slides. Yeah, so the pathologists are staining and seeing ah, the slides. So, so as it is being done, I think yes. you can show us the remaining biopsy techniques. So now, so now we will be showing the biopsy techniques, sir. We will be starting with the needle biopsy. Uh, we are using the acquired needle, the 22 gauge acquired needle with the so Francine tip. you start, I think, see, if this is more for demonstration, we are doing all these things. But in the, when you do on a daily basis, it is not essential that you do biopsy for everybody. This is something which we should learn. 
So what we do is we all because we have a rose. If the pathologist says there are granulomas, then we are happy. We don't have to do any biopsy. If they say there is okay, the good number of malignant cells, again we don't do a biopsy. When there is no diagnosis, or if there is malignancy but scant atypical cells, we tend to do a biopsy. So of the biopsy technique, there are several things which will be shown. I think now the pathologist also is ready. Sweta yes. Madam and Subraja Madam are there. Yeah, so uh, we are seeing a cluster of cells. Can we have it camera rows? Yeah, sir. <laughs> so we are trying, sir. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know whether we will be able to see through the camera, but madam, whatever you tell, we, we strongly we will believe you. Yeah, so we have a sensational cluster of cells which uh, has a eosinophilic cytoplasm. The cells are slipper shaped, elongated. Any prose diagnosis on the description? Granuloma. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it is a granuloma for us. So, uh, but there is no necrosis in the background. So we have uh, seen it, the imprint smears as well as the smears which are prepared from EBUS FNSE. I think the beauty of this thing is that the first pass itself sometimes gives the diagnosis. And madam, can you just take a, ha, uh -huh, exactly, that's what I was saying, WhatsApp pros. See, see, what was it much better? I think the beauty of a of, of a WhatsApp and a smartphone. Madam, what, what we are seeing, is it the granuloma? Yeah, this is a granuloma. It is showing syncytium of cells suspended in an eosinophilic background. That is the cytoplasm has coalesced together and these cells are actually round to avoid to slipper shaped at places. So this is a granuloma for sure. That is a problem with the phone, <laughs> you get calls. <laughs> <laughs> There is no necrosis in the background though. Very, very beautifully seen. I think most of you can see the beauty of a, <laughs> of a smart gadget. I think uh, uh, Pratip, you can please take over and start demonstrating other procedures because yes, you have to show a lot of things to the audience. Yes, sir. So now uh -huh. we'll be showing the... No, see, by ideally speaking, you won't require biopsy. But biopsy is being done for the benefit of the audience. The various techniques will be shown. So the first technique is the needle biopsy. So that's called the FNB. Now it's not called TBNA, it's called the EBUS FNB, fine needle biopsy. So that is the uh, tail pratip. So for this we are using the 22G acquire uh, needle, which has the crown shaped uh, or the francine tip, uh, which provides us with cores. So for this we need to change the adapter. Can you show us the tip please? Yes sir, one second. Ad Don't pick yourself, huh? Yeah, yeah. So, can you please focus on the tip? But the, this will be shown tomorrow on the station also, in case you are not able yes. to appreciate it well. I think it makes a better zoom in. I think it can be seen tomorrow in the in the work station. Okay. We'll proceed with the with how how we can get a core Yeah. Okay. Adapter. Adapter. Yeah. So the adapter has been placed and now we will be passing the needle through the channel. Yeah. So every needle has its own mechanism of fixing. So this, uh, the Boston needles generally have a screw like mechanism which we will just screw it on and tighten it and lock it. So a sheet needs to be fixed for this needle too before every procedure. So we will just fix the sheet. As you can see the sheet is completely out. Now I am just taking back the sheet. The sheet is black in color. This sheet is black in color. So now we can see the sheath in the top right corner. Okay. So there are two knobs which we can see in the needle. One is for the sheath to be fixed and the other is for the white length of the needle. So how much should we go in? We have to decide. The previous one was fixed at 2 cm. It does give us an option to go up to 4 to 5 cm. Dr. Nitish, you can start the procedure as you yeah. do. Okay. 
Another add-on procedure is the transbronchial lung biopsy, especially in this case the fissural nodules were uh, seen. So even in a normal appearing CT lung parenchyma, sarcoidosis can be picked up in 15 to 20 percent additional cases if we can do a transbronchial and endobronchial lung biopsy, even if it was uh, normal or not. But yes, many centers do not do it because of the risk of additional complications. Because the TBL is the one which often ends up with the complication of pneumothorax and bleed. So we are just navigating towards the 11L node. So we are in the LMB right now, going to the secondary carina. Now we will enlarge the ultrasound vision. Uh, what I wanted to ask was with the different size of needle, do you uh, check for the vascularity and do you prefer the less vascular nodes for the larger needle or do you choose anything specifically? So, in, in general we would choose a less vascular node, but if there is a, if there is no option then I think uh, we would still uh, go about and uh, do. Uh, what is your experience with uh, the stations like 4R for such a larger needle? On this? The chances of training are higher with the Procore at least we have high problem with the larger needle. No, normally we, we don't use too much Procore since the time we have access to the acquired. Uh, we, if at all we want a, a needle biopsy, we use uh, acquired. The problem with the acquired is the cost. I think this is something which we should also remember that it is uh, in Indian currency at least 10 to 15,000 which is more costly than the the Olympus uh, needle, but if cost is not a constraint, then uh, definitely you think uh, this would score more. It would depend upon your preference also. So, wh while doing a FNB with acquired needle, one thing that we have to remember is that the needle does not come at the same angle as the 21G needle. It generally comes at a more acute angle that is closer to the surface, to closer to the bronchial surface. Yeah, the sheet was not seen previously. Now we can see the sheet yes. in the inset image. The audience can look at the inset image for they are adjusting the sheet and we can see the black uh, shadow of the sheet. The safety measure they need to check every time before they take a pass. I think they are trying to find the correct place to put the needle. So it depends on which node are they targeting. Are they trying to focus? Sir, give it to me sir. I need to switch it on and off whenever they want it. Which node is it? Is it the subcarinal or the carinal? Dr. Nagarjuna? Yeah. How do you recommend uh, flushing of saline or using cold saline? after the first sampling has been done? No. no normally we don't uh, do anything. The bleed is very minimal and usually doesn't uh, have a problem even after a biopsy. So I think the last several uh, biopsies we have done also, I think only one case we have had to use uh, an extra technique to instill and stop the bleeding. So most of the times it is a self-limited uh, minimal loose that's all.
So while they are doing, I think now the next thing practically relevant for in this case is to differentiate TB from sarcoid. So now that uh, Rose has already confirmed uh, the presence of granulomas, so now the next thing for us is to uh, get material for microbiology one. Uh, now tuberculin skin test definitely I think uh, has a role because if in a patient of granulomatous node, if you get a strongly positive mantle, then you rule out sarcoid. So that is the role of TST. Third is what Dr. Valiapan had said, getting an EBB and TBLB, even though the, the, the mucosa seems apparently normal. So from apparently normal looking mucosa and a normal looking lung parenchyma, if you prove granulomas, that is again favoring sarcoid. So now these are the three things I think which we should be doing in this case, doing a tuberculin skin test, um, uh, getting material for microbiology and uh, if possible, add on EBB and TBLB because that will increase the diagnostic confidence if when you are looking at sarcoidosis. If we had done a flexible bronchoscopy, yeah, there's some question, yeah. If 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 this lymphoma is a suspicion, whether selecting a station depending upon PET scan does that have any role? I think uh, anyway, you would need a histopathology and cytology, and you are already doing that. A PET CIT would not add anything it, except for adding for the cost. Once they diagnose the lymphoma, sometimes they do ask it for staging, but pre procedure doing for anyone would be a overkill and it's not required. Here we can see the. and we are ready to do the biopsy. So here we will be fixing the length of the needle first. We are fixing it at about two and a half. Yes. So with acquire, with acquire, we need to. Yes. We have just loosened the stilet, and now we'll be jabbing inside. You are inside actually. You are the angle of the needle. Yes. So now this is so the periphery are, of the node. Yes. I think this is another thing, whether the sample the center of the node or the periphery of the node. What do you have your take on this thing? So now or some so sometimes going to the periphery is also not wrong. So okay. I think okay. any any comments on the experience. I think so it is preferable if we go completely across the node so that we are touching both the borders. So that would be more helpful in getting a better sample and a better lead. There are uh, two things regarding it. One is the safety of the procedure. In terms of safety, going to the center might be the safest because you have a margin of error. But in terms of diagnosis, they say that the periphery of the node is where the malignant cells are more easily picked up. So uh, I think this is what I was waiting to hear. Sometimes it is said that in a malignant node, the central part becomes a little more necrotic, tends to have lesser cells. So if you can sometimes try to go to the periphery, you might actually have better yield for the malignancy. So going to the periphery is not wrong, but as Valipan has rightly said, you should be careful that you don't go uh, across the node and you should be careful as when you tend to do the revolutions. And the other thing is uh, the operators uh, rotate the wrist and take, do it at a different dilation uh, aiming to target a different but how much it adds to the aim is cryo and this. So now there are three, three techniques. One is the normal conventional technique. Second yeah. is the panning um, technique which is talking yeah. about. Okay. So every time you pull, pull the they are talking little bit out you slightly Sir. change the angulation, then go in. So that's called the fanning technique. And the technique which has been demonstrated is the uh, this low capillary uh, pullback technique, where you don't apply suction actually. You only slightly withdraw the stillet, and as you withdraw the stillet, you do the revolutions. So did we manage to get a biopsy? Yes, sir. Can you show? Please focus on the core. And 
Sí. So, so, so that is a, it's a good coat. It looks like a true coat, not very red in color, small, mm -hmm. decent piece. So, so that is how you get a coat. Coat need not be long like a snake, which is normally projected. Even a small one centimeter length thing is also given up. Money to you target, uh, how many cores you so I don't think there are any answer for that question. The ideal number of cores, I think a three, three or four is what we normally tend to get. And acquired needle is one needle where, uh, as I have said, the majority of times you get a core. And we look at our data with acquired, of all the cores we get, not every core is a true core. True core means that it has cells and not blood. So a false core means it either has a cartilage in it or it has only blood. Sometimes you get what looks like a core macroscopically can just be a piece of cartilage or it can just be a blood clot. So only around 80 to 90 percent of the cores are actually true cores. So that is uh, the final uh, on preparation. And I think cores make more sense when you are doing the research just because that's where you want the molecular analysis. So it gives you a larger tissue sample. Of course, your pathologist is more happy, and so is your oncologist. Yes. So in this case, I really, as I have said, we don't need uh, this thing, but this is just for the audience to have a vision of a fine needle biopsy. Now, Pratik, you will be showing the cryobiopsy. Now, I'll be showing the cryobiopsy, sir. Yes. So, so Pratik is our master reverse uh, person. <laughs> I think who, given the chance, can blindfold it, we also do some fancy procedure. You so, can see his beautiful so place. Do you always do your reverses with the Doppler board on or is it just like it's on right sir, now? Sir, uh, I always do it for every pass. For every pass we recheck. Even if I am in the same location as a, ha as a matter of habit, we recheck before every pass that we are going in the bloodless area. Okay. But as Kedan has said, if you try to do the jabs with the Doppler on, it yes. creates a lot of Yeah, we, 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 we so always remove the Doppler once we have uh, focused on the right area. Exactly. So once you see, you identify the site, you can remove the Doppler and then do the puncture. So now I have, I am using a 19G needle here to create a tract. So I am focused on the 11L node and I have fixed the needle at about 2.5 centimeters. And I have just jabbed in the node. The other thing is to get, get the needle in the center of the node. I think we should put the node more towards the distal the, the part in the center so that the training will go in the center. What is your opinion? I think the, for the, the new learners, the blue dot on the top, which is the point of the entry of the needle. So if we can see the needle enters to the point where it is marked in the blue dot. So we can adjust so that the node when we visualize and measure it will be in the center of the conical field of vision. But when we try to take a pass we try to keep it towards the left side so that the needle goes into the center of the area where we want the sample. So now what he has done is he has tried to create a track using a 19G needle. So, so the track has been created and now to the same track. So now we, to the same track I am using a 1.1 mm mini cryo probe. See the shadow of the track in the ultrasound image if you see carefully. So where the previous track are gone we are able to see a shadow. So here you can see that the that the 1.1 mm cryo ah, so has entered the lymph node. So here one thing is that the whole, unlike in needle, the needle the whole thing is echogenic. So in the 1.1 mm cryo probe only the tip is echogenic. So you can see the tip but not the probe. So that is how a 1.1 cryo probe looks within the lymph node. So through a track he has gone inside, again check with the Doppler. Yes, so now remove Doppler. Yes. Yeah, now I will be activating it for about 4 to 5 seconds. The first pass generally activate for about 4 seconds and see the size of the biopsy piece. Now we are putting it off end block. So this is standard for any cryo technique that the whole scope has to come out end block with the thing. Can you show the tip of the, the probe please? Uh, I will just show it in the next pass sir. I think they removed it. Okay, very fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs>
so I will just show it in the next part. The, the this patient is in an artificial airway and completely sedated. But yes. For those who are doing it under moderate sedation, this could be a little challenging. That uh, the track which we had seen and it, uh, to keep it in the same place and to pass the cryo becomes difficult. The patient might be breathing rapidly or he might cough, and the track he might lose the track. So that is one another thing. Okay, that's it. No problem. Okay, sir. So I am again inside the node. I am again activating for 5 seconds this time and pulling it out end block while act keeping my cryo activated. No, 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 no. So, if you can switch off the light, you can see the light. Lamp, 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 lamp. You can see the tissue which is stuck to the tip of the cryo. So, that is how we get a piece. It's easy to get a piece around 5 to 4 meters from the cryo. So if you get anywhere between 2 to 4 pieces, you are almost getting a 1 cm long uh, biopsy from the lymph node, which is very good for most of the diagnosis. Okay. Now, now generally we thaw it in saline the and then fix it in formalin. Endovision. Endovision. So, so it is not essential that you always see a big opening. Uh, unless I mean, you, you push the sheet like what Dr. Kitbath has said. So, if you push the sheet inside, then obviously the opening is bigger. Here they have used the 19 g needle. So, the main thing is to remember where you have actually gone inside, go to the same, uh, fix the scope in that location, don't change. And then the, the moment 19 g needle is outside, you put the trap probe inside. So, you don't have to move around too much. You can be Scope fixed, yes. Scope, you, you know where you function. So, mostly it's the operator who takes the judgment uh, if he is at the same place. Because you might not achieve much, even if you get to see the uh, yes. the track that has been created, you won't be able to put it through a process. Yeah, I think the most important thing is I get, remember the location where you function on the endosonovision. So, on the endosonovision, you have enough idea as to where you function. And then the same thing you can do, but sometimes you can see the track either as a high coic line or sometimes as a hyperchoic line both. You can see even without the needle, sometimes if you move, you can see that line. Pratik, we are taking the third pass now? Yes, sir. I am just taking the third pass. My cryo probe has gone inside. The tip can be visualized in the node. So that doctor is an artifact doctor. Yeah, that is just beside the probe. So the problem of having a doctor wrong with the needle is that you see a lot of artifacts which are not actually vessels. So now I will just switch over to the endobronchial vision to be larger so that when I come out it will be easier to see. So I am again activating for 5 seconds. I am pulling it out end block. Just clean the tip. Just clean the tip. Just clean the tip of the cryo. Oh, switch on the light. Yes, I think I think this is good demonstration of how a cryopropsy can be done. Follow the 19G CBNA track needle. If you don't have a 19G, now 19G supply is also limited because of some production issues. So the other way to create a track is uh, what Dr. Kitiba has said. 21G with the sheet, you push it inside forcefully or you can use a pottery knife. So separate ways to... Mini cryo... Uh, sorry, the... Mini forceps. You want to do forceps also? So the third technique to get a biopsy is the forceps. So now he has shown the mini biopsy, the cryo biopsy. Or the third technique is to do a forceps biopsy. I think after this we will. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we will just demonstrate one forceps biopsy. Cryo, yeah, no, actually speaking, 1.1 is the safest and probably the only. I have come across only one article. Where they managed to pass 1.7. I don't know how they, I also am surprised as to how they could put a 1.7 in a cryoprobe into the node. But there is one publication where they put a 1.7. But I would not ask anyone to put a 1.7 into the node. 1.1 is sufficient enough to get us a good tissue. So some centers use the cryoprobe to touch the entry site to create a bigger track. But I think so 1.1 is good for the sample and for your reverse probe. Mind you, none of the companies are still saying that your reverse scope is meant for the cryo probe. So, if, if something goes wrong, you have nothing to claim for. <laughs> the company won't repair it. So, now I am using the 1 mm spy bite forceps, which is from Boston. So, this so is a Boston spy bite forceps. It is 1 mm in diameter. So, it is one 
smaller than the Close. entire probe, it's the one that has four cells. Close. But what Dr. Kitiwat has shown is the radiolibus four cells, right? So, so I think basically whichever smallest four cells you have, you can try to pass in. You have dedicated pediatric four cells also which you can use. Right. So when we want to do a four cell work, which uh -huh. we don't do nowadays, is we use this spy bike, the Boston spy bike. Uh, uh, so now I am inside the node. Okay, he is already inside. Okay. Yeah. Can you open, open, open the forceps. You can see it open now. Close. I think people can see the, the, the forceps which is opened inside so, and now we are trying to take a browse. So just for demonstration, again opening and closing it. Open. open. Yes, close. Close. Yes, open. Close. Yes, I think it is beautifully seen of the vision. The advantage of uh, all these techniques is that it is real time. Okay, but the problem with the forceps biopsy is the fact that you get a lot of crushed tissue. So we have, we have, we have we had done it in a lot of cases earlier. Uh, but once we started getting the acquired and the cryo, so we almost stopped using the forceps. Because finally it is a crushed tissue which we tend to get. Whereas in the, in the cryo and the needle biopsy, you tend to get lesser artifacts. So as you can see, despite uh, th three cryo biopsies and there's one no forceps way. biopsy, there is hardly any bleeding. Can you show the cryo biopsy also, the, the, the gross thing, just for the audience, how the size of the pieces are? I think we have demonstrated all the techniques, really. that is good enough. Any doubts from the audience? Chal, this case is done. Yes, for I think for uh, passing any extra accessory, whether to pass a cryoprobe or to pass a forceps, you have to have a tract. Only for the needle biopsies, that is the beauty of needle biopsies, you have two, three biopsy needles. One is the 19G needle, itself is a biopsy needle. The, the, Bost, the Boston Acquire needle is a biopsy needle and the Cook's Procore needle is a biopsy needle. For these biopsy needles, the, the, tract it's, the needle itself is the tract. So the advantage of a biopsy needle is that you can take biopsies from multiple areas. In the sense, within the node, you can sample different areas, different times. You can get biopsies from different areas. But if you use a cryo or a forceps, then you always go into the same tract. So whatever tract is created, if you take four biopsies, all the four are from the same tract. You can change the depth at which you freeze. You can freeze at different depths, but it's in the same tract. So that is one advantage of a needle biopsy over a cryo or a forceps biopsy. I think these are all things which are evolving. So if you ask uh, whether there is any, any uh, lot of robust data, then I would say that data is still being generated. But I think there is reasonable data that it might be better than a normal uh, TBNA, at least for non-conventional malignancies. So the experts say if you are a beginner, you leave all of this yes. for Correct. specialized centers until we get proper RCTs uh, giving us any proper advantage of actually doing a cryo inside Correct. a node. Till then we can leave it for the expert to do it and we can attend these programs. I think this is also very, very important thing. It is not that we want everyone to do. We have just demonstrated for the sake of completion that all of these are there, can be done. Nevertheless, I wouldn't recommend that even we don't do biopsies in all cases. I think you should not go home with the message that we do biopsy in all cases. We do not do. We only do for a small subset of people where we, as, as I have said, rose is inconclusive. So only then we do. Yeah, I think uh, do. just to add to what you already said, Nagarjun, your own paper, you have an algorithm where you say yes. where there is a negative rose, rose, that's when they try to attempt one of these techniques. So I think please do not think of these accessory additional techniques as your main, uh, you know, EBUS technique for doing your biopsies. So if your rose is negative or if you have an EBUS which is first negative and then you decide to do one of these accessory techniques, I think that must be fair as of now. With more RCT data coming out, I think things will become more clearer. Nagarjo, do you have your algorithm? Why don't you no, the algorithm it if, which we have yeah, proposed? Because, yeah, you it, have proposed it, one. So that's why I thought if you have it uh, as a slide, it will be great. approved by other centers. So it's a proposed algorithm. So what we do is we do EBUS TBNA. So always TBNA. TBNA with either 21G or 22G needle. It doesn't matter which needle you use. And we do ROSE. So not pros, not WhatsApp pros, it is ROSE. So we have a, we are, we have a pathologist, so we do ROSE. So we ask two things. 
uh, what is the probable diagnosis and what is the material adequacy. Two things we ask. If the pathologist says it is granuloma, clear cut, then there is no need for any biopsy. If the pathologist says it is malignancy, then if we ask for the cellularity. We are lucky all to have the pathologist who can also comment on the adequacy. If they say that there are very few scattered atypical cells, then you would require more material. If the pathologist says it is malignant and good cellular, then we don't need a biopsy, we just take a cell block. We take three, four more passes in the cell block and we are done. So we do biopsy only in two instances. If the pathologist says we don't know what it is, so it is inconclusive rose. Or if the pathologist says there are scant atypical cells. Now scant again, you can ask me, is there any objective criteria? I would say no. It is the pathologist, because we have been doing it for the last eight years, the pathologist also now to a reasonable extent predict whether on rows this cell block is going to be sufficient for molecular markers or not. So only when it is inconclusive rows or a posicellular rows, so only then we will do a by any biopsy, it, it not necessarily cryo, we can choose any biopsy, but we do. So if you look at the overall percentage of cases, it would be less than 10%. Yeah. So I think that is the yeah, thing. Yes, so by meaning rows, it is not one node. So we, t we sample all the nodes, and even if one node shows a diagnosis, that is sufficient. So the other thing is, by whichever node shows material, that node you will take for ancillary studies. So whichever node has the maximum granulomatous yield or maximum at atypical cells, that node you will sample for the uh, accessory tests. So if you want to take a genetic test sample, you ask also the pathologist that which node has the maximum material, ma maximum yield, and that node you will sample. So ROWS actually helps us in diagnosis, triaging for the need of biopsy, and also triaging uh, for which ancillary test to be done. I think all of these are there. Yeah. Uh, if the multiple nodes, we will first screen all the nodes. We will see all the nodes. Whichever node is least vascular and the largest is the one which is usually sampled first.